Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again. Mishmash Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, it's another hot one today, so we're going to be in and out. Try and get a quick one done for you. Uh, some good news this week. I have uh, I have a couple new additions to the pigeon coop. For those of you who do not know, I do have a pigeon coop. I've, I've been a fascinated, fascinated by pigeons my whole life. My neighbor years ago when I was a kid had a pigeon coop and I would watch the pigeons circle the homes and you know fly uh during the day and he would release them every day it was just amazing so i uh about 17 years ago i made a coop and i have some pigeons but i don't have any more fancy pigeons now just regular kind of street pigeons that i that come and go but uh i have two new ones that were just born a week ago and take a look at these guys uh you know they're not they are kind of alien looking when they're first born. You know, they do look kind of strange, but I like them. And uh, they will be as big as their parents in about uh, a month. So it takes about a month for them to get as big as they usually born two, two pigeons uh, uh, to a, uh, a set of uh, birds. And the, and the mother and father will nurse them until they, they reach maturity. And a lot of people wonder why, why pigeons, you know, they, they're kind of... Pigeons are the most misunderstood, underrated animal on the planet. Fa fascinating animals. And, uh, you know, we used them uh, back in the wars, you know, before communications, you know, before wireless communications, even wired communications. You know, p carrier pigeons were a big part and saved many a life on both sides uh, of, uh, of the conflicts. And, and it, I'll tell you, one of them, I don't know if you ever heard the story of uh, Cherami which means my friend in French, uh, amazing bird. The story goes back in World War I, the 77th Division got out ahead of the flanking divisions and they were behind the German was lines. kind of surrounded by the Germans back in, like I said, World War I. And um, they were running out of food and supplies and ammunition. And so they were trapped and they were trying to release these... Uh, carrier pigeons because now they were receiving friendly fire from the americans their own their own uh companies were bombing them and they were saying they were getting destroyed so they tried to send these uh, carrier pigeons up but the germans knew about these birds and would shoot them down as soon as they could they had special guns almost like buckshot would shoot these birds down and they were down to like one bird left uh Cherami, and uh they let the bird go, and, and sure enough, the Germans zeroed in and shot it down, shot it right through the chest and blew its leg off. But do you know that bird, through pure grit and determination, got up, flew again 25 miles to uh, to the Americans and, and let them know, have it, the, the uh, message, gave the message to the American command to stop the bombing, that you're bombing us, and uh, the actual message was uh, still attached and and it was amazing, you know, it stayed, the bird was credited with saving uh, over 190 lives, you know, and then they uh, eventually they were, you know, rescued and they got out and just amazing uh, from this. And this is not a rare occurrence. There was many pigeons awarded men, medals and things like that during uh, the wars and just fantastic birds. But an uh, interesting story. Sure, a me. Remember that. I think it, the bird is stuffed and in the Smithsonian now. But uh, it did survive the war, but died soon after because of uh, war wounds. It was uh, had the leg blown off and was shot through the chest and lost one of its eyes or something. But grit and determination. You got to love that. Okay, so first up, we got a few things to talk about. Let me tell you something about... Uh, uh, some subscribers that let me know some things. Let me show okay, you. Okay, first up, last week we did a, uh, a nice little punch regrind on this uh, wild punch that was broken. And I showed this one punch saying that this one here was a, a, a punch that I assumed, you know, there's my big mistake, that this was another regrind that it was cut off. Because it does look kind of like, you know, like it was a homemade cut off thing, right? But uh, Spencer Eagle... One of our good subscribers, he pointed out that indeed this was not a modified punch. This was a screw extractor, which I'll tell you the truth. I didn't even know that. I've never seen this type. I had to research it. And sure enough, this Proto 9526 is a screw extractor. Now, 
basically what that means is if you have a bolt and this would have to be a pretty big bolt about this big if this was broken off into some uh into maybe a casting or something you would drill a hole in the bolt and then you would bang this in and then use a wrench to extract the screw uh you don't see these too often because they're not really the best type to use although the proto you know they make good tools and stuff i'm sure this works but uh, the preferred type, if ever you want to get a pair of screw extractors, are this type here. This is a fine, these are great. They work really well. And uh, you, what you do here, you got to get a, a decent set if you can. You know, the, obviously the cheap sets will perform just like the cheap tools. But uh, what you do is you drill a hole and you bang this in. And you can see it's a left-handed thread and it would, should spin it out. So... Uh, Spencer Eagle, thank you so much for pointing that out. This was not modified. This is the way it does come with this flat tip from the factory. This is a proto. It, you, they usually came in sets, but this is a type of screw extractor. Thank you for that. Okay, next up, you remember uh, we made this Corian base for this hammer, you know, this to uh, hold this hammer. And a lot of people enjoyed seeing the use of Corian. In fact, we have a few people in uh, the subscribers that actually work with Corian, make it, produce it. And, uh, and also uh, use it in, in uh, fabrications and stuff. It's amazing stuff. DuPont makes it expensive. And it's, uh, you've got to be certified to work with it. They won't let anybody just do it. You have to go through courses, things like that. So interesting material. But my buddy, uh, Mr. Doughboy, 356 Cliff. Cliff said you should make some knife handles out of it. And I actually have. I made a, a bunch of... Uh, here's one. This is a, a knife handle I made out of uh, orange Corian. I made this, and I use this knife quite a bit. Uh, this is a, uh, a Russell, a Green River Works. You could buy this blank here. And this is a, actually, this holds some edge. I'll tell you, this this carbon steel, uh, and it doesn't rust. Like I said, I use this in the kitchen, but it's a, a great knife and we we'll use it a lot. And that was the handle I made for that. And I also made uh, out of, this is a beautiful, look at this. This is like a, it's got like sparkles in it. I forget the name of this. It's, it's a popular one, but I made this handle. This is a uh, a K bar, okay? And um, I forget the name. Warthog. Yeah, it's a K bar Warthog. And this knife, I always liked. It was a heavy duty knife, you know. Which, but the handle was short. The handle like ended here, and I got big mitts, you know. I don't want to be grabbing a small handle. So what I did was, you could see, I extended the handle. You know, you can see here I extended it and uh, look at that, you know, uh, so it ended here and I extended it down. So I added this little part here. I put in a little lanyard, uh, pinned it. Nice handle, right? Much, much nicer, much better user knife. But uh, there we go. Another Corian scales. They do. I'm telling you, you can do so much with Corian. It's a great material, but I said it's a little on the expensive side. But if you buy it in scraps or leftovers or drops, that's the way to do okay, it. Okay, next up. Remember, I was talking about banks last week. A lot of you like that. You know, you have brought back memories of saving as a kid. Well, here is an interesting bank. Let me do a quick cleanup on it because you can see it's, you know, a little bit. Let me do a quick cleanup and I'll demonstrate this cool counting bank. Okay, we cleaned it up, a little Plastex polish, a little uh, Carnuba, Mother's Carnuba wax, and you can see what a nice job it did, huh? Just came out beautiful. Now, how this bank worked, these were giveaways a lot of times. Uh, this one here, Fidelity Federal, okay, and that was uh, out of Ohio. My buddy James is in Ohio. He loves Ohio tools. How this would work, you could see here, nice little bank. Um, you, would, you see it says start up here. See, it says start. You would push this lever up to there. And then you would drop your coin in here. So let's say you had a quarter. You would put your quarter in there. And then when you pull this lever down, okay, when you pull it down like this, it registers 25 cents. You see? Because we just put a quarter in. Now, uh, again, if we put another quarter in and uh, pull it through like this, watch, it'll go 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, and then eventually 50 because there's two quarters in there. And this will count your money. Now we're going to put a nickel in. Okay. See? 55. Okay. We'll put a dime in. It's pretty amazing how this works, right? Should say 65. 
There we go. 65, you see? So you know how much you have in there. Now, if you kept putting enough uh, money in here, you know, eventually this would come up. Now we got 90 cents. If we put in a quarter, you see what happens here. We have a dollar fifteen. So the bank would count your money up to, uh, I believe, almost ten dollars or whatever. Now, to uh, to retrieve your money, it came with a key, okay, and this is the key that it came with here. And what you would do is you would go to the back here. And you can see the writing on there. You can see called Add a Bank, and uh, it says uh, Nichols Dimes. Now, if you put a, a penny in, I know you're all thinking, what about a penny? It doesn't register the penny. It'll take the money, but it won't register it, much like the government. And now what happens is when you take your key and you put it in here like this, it raises up. There's your money in here. You retrieve your money. Okay. Take your money out of there. And then, uh, now I lubricate everything. It's nice and clean and lubricated. To uh, close it, you just push it down like this stops well-made bank right I'm trying to see you could see where that's made there I'm trying to get the here okay and the writing now uh to reset this you uh put the key in here like this push this down and this will reset this to uh you gotta finagle it a little bit there we go see and you could uh, oh it'll hold up to twenty dollars see but you, uh, you turn this around here until you get it back to zero, okay? And that's how, uh, that's how you would replace and get this back to zero. So there we go. It's back to zero. Many of us have had, I had the, and still do have the cash register bank, which is wildly popular. Uh, that I think you had to put in $10 before you can open up the door. Uh, but very interesting little counter banks. They do command some good money. But uh, speaking of banks, let me show you this one here we're going to work on today. Okay, a little bit of a warning for you. I know some of you people out there have, uh, are light, have light stomachs. Like, for example, some people get creeped out by this little hand. They get creeped out. They're, ooh, they get goosebumps. I'm telling you right now, here's a creep out warning for those of you with a weak stomach. This one here, some people find creepy. I find just adorable. This here, as you know, one of the more popular mechanical banks. And uh, the, the coin mechanical banks started off in the, uh, like, 1869. They went to the 1920s. They were wildly popular to get people to collect money, kids, and whatnot. Uh, most of them, 95% of them are reproductions because uh, the early ones are collect crazy money. For, so if you have an original... Uh, mechanical bank, you you have uh, quite a find there in the thousands of dollars, if not more. So, uh, but they've been reproducing these and re copying these since the early uh, 1900s. So you can have a reproduction that's uh, 65, 70 years old. And this one here is an old one, but a nice reproduction, nice casting. This one here is from Taiwan and, uh, you know, nice paint. The problem is there was a lever here that broke off, okay? There's a lever back here that broke off. Now, how this operates, you can see here, he has, uh, his eyes will roll down, his tongue will move out of the way as you push the lever down, and this will drop the coin into his mouth, okay? Did you see the, uh, the eyes will, like I said, the eyes will drop, you know, and that's how that basically works. The eyes drop down, the tongue moves out of the way, and, but I don't know what's inside. Let's take it apart see if we can't make some kind of lever here okay you can see when the two halves are together i'm showing you from the bottom there's a way that this revolves okay this acts as almost like a bearing surface here you see that and so we can't really we have to add some material in order to make a lever that comes because it's got to be strong you're going to be pushing down on it you know and you want that snapping action you can't have something just weak there it's got to be strong enough that it can go through the motions. That's why it's snapped off. And yet, um, I can't really sister something on the edge here because I don't have enough room to pass through this bearing, this kind of makeshift bearing here, uh, riding surface. So I have to think of a way to uh, have a lever come out of here but be strong enough and hold on to the arm. I have enough room that I can add a little bit extra in here, you see. But... Uh, Again, it has to be working, so let's figure this out. Maybe have some lunch and we'll come back and see what we can come up with.
Okay, so here's what we came up with. Uh, what we did was uh, we drilled a hole that there's enough material. Now, I checked this material by grinding it. No voids is a very strong casting. So this this uh, metal is, is quite strong. I don't have to worry about it being brittle or anything. But what I did was I took a piece of spring steel. The reason I took spring steel, and this is a K&S music wire, it's called, but it's a spring steel, because it'll have some give, but when I put it in here, and I had to, I didn't want to drill this hole out any bigger, because I needed that amount around it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this into here, and you can see that it's a nice fit going in, okay, it's almost like a press fit once it gets in there, okay, I mean, that's in there, right, good fit, now what we'll do is uh, we'll JB weld and put around this to secure it, make sure it's, uh, but you see now, we, uh, when this goes on here like this, Okay, that goes like that. The back of the head goes on here like this. Okay, now we'll screw that on, obviously. But when it's like this now, you see what happens. Now we have this protruding out, and you can see, very strong, very secure. The only thing is, obviously, this has to be more comfortable. So we'll drill and uh, put a little, you know, a little handle here so that it's more comfortable to use. So that's uh, very enjoyable. Okay, I just came back from my walk tonight and I found some crazy things. First of all, I found this, a glow stick. Do you remember these? I mean, I, even as a kid, I found these to be absolutely amazing. You would break the little glass vial in there, shake it up, and you would have light for like six to eight hours. And oh, as a kid, and, and you know, usable light. This thing was great. And uh, we used to use this in the scouts all the time. We used to use them in the service. They had different ones. They had really ultra bright ones that only lasted 30 minutes. But uh, those things would be, forget it. We used to use these for LZs, all kinds of stuff. I still find them amazing. How do you get light without any heat whatsoever? Chemical light, like the lightning bug. Just absolutely amazing. We used to do all kinds of cool things when we were signaling scouts. We'd stand you know, a quarter mile away and tell the kids to shoot a certain compass bearing. And then all of a sudden we would show them us. We'd show up with that circular light. It was just fantastic. Now, two other things I wanted to do on him. I went to fix his eyes. I think they look a little too beady. You know, the pupils, it's just pupils. It needs an iris in there. Also, you see how this is. His eyes are just a floating piece of cast iron. And I wanted to also fix and paint his tongue. And to do that, you know, we'll just take a little bit of white paint, a little red, draw it together to get the right shade, and then we'll paint his tongue, that the nice pink colored tongue. And we're calling this project done. You can see what we did here. We put a little lever here that will make it work nice and easy. The eyes work very nicely now. You can see the eyes go up and down the way they're supposed to. And uh, he's very hungry for money. You know, it doesn't matter if you put a quarter in, if you put a penny in, whatever denomination, a dime, he's a hungry little clown. So there we go. The patent on this bank was June 17th, 1884. Okay, so in closing, we uh, covered a couple things today. Hope you had a, uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. You know, there was an old saying years ago when there was an accident or something happened at the circus they would send in the clowns, you know, to uh, divert attention, you know. Uh, all of a sudden, the clowns would come in, stage left, and the spotlight would go on them, and you wouldn't see the guy that fell off the trapeze. Well, they're pretty much saying that's the way the world is going now, that we're kind of being distracted by the clowns. What do you think? Anyway, thanks so much. I hope you have a great day. Take care now. Bye-bye.